Good evening and welcome to this forum where we will hear from candidates for the St. Peter School Board. Tonight we are videotaping at the St. Peter High School Performing Arts C Center. The event is hosted tonight by the League of Women Voters along with their co-sponsors, the St. Peter Herald and St. Peter Chamber of Commerce. I am um, thrilled to be here tonight. I am a member of the New Alm League of Women Voters and I will be your moderator this evening. Harriet Mason, a member of the St. Peter League of Women Voters is assisting me. The reason that I am here as a New Alm member is because one of our candidates is a St. Peter League of Women Voters member and per League of Women Voter policies for candidate forums, we get an impartial moderator for events uh, when we have a candidate uh, as a member of the slate. The um, questions that will be presented to the candidates tonight are all screened by the League of Women Voters pursuant to uh, time-tested rules established by the Minnesota and national and local League of Women Voters. Um, the final decision as to the questions that are asked tonight will be my responsibility as the moderator. League of Women Voters is a local, state, and national nonpartisan grassroots 501c3 organization that promotes the active, informed involvement of citizens in the voting process. The League neither supports nor opposes candidates um, or political parties in any election. This forum is being recorded tonight and will be aired on St. Peter Public Access TV and on St. Peter's YouTube channel. Tonight's questions were gathered from the public, the St. Peter League of Women Voters, as well as our co-hosts. All questions have been reviewed, as I noted. Um, they've been reviewed by the League Forum team, the Chamber of Commerce and, or excuse me, and the Chamber of Commerce President, Ed Lee. Per League of Women Voters policy, we will not ask questions that are unclear, that are on personal matters unrelated to the elective position, questions that are hostile or that are submitted for the purpose of making a statement rather than gaining information. Questions that we may have received on one issue or similar issues may be consolidated or rephrased. We will be posing the questions to the candidates in a random order, but all of the candidates will be offered the opportunity to answer all of the questions. Finally, as is a League of Women Voters rule, all of the questions become the property of the League of Women Voters uh, at the, at, um, in the forum. The candidates are seated in alphabetical order. Each one will be allowed 1.25 minutes for opening statements and 1.25 minutes to make a closing statement. They will also be given one and a half minutes to answer each question that is posed. We have timekeepers here in the audience, Cindy Olson and Pat Kahn. They will be tracking the sign, or excuse me, tracking the time and they will hold up a yellow sign when 15 seconds remain and a stop sign when time is up. Candidates, you may finish your sentence um, if you're in the middle of a sentence when a stop sign appears. Um, but we appreciate um, and, and have a great history of these forums of, of candidates honoring those rules. So we look forward to um, a healthy discussion. Uh, voters, when you go to the polls for this uh, position, you will be asked to choose three, um, you vote for three people um, the following candidates are running for the position of school board, all of whom have been invited to participate. John Carlson, Mr. Carlson had a conflict and I have a statement from him. Drew Dixon, Marty Duncan is also unable to attend tonight. Terry Hopkins, Vicki Hager, Crystal Lola, Kate Martins, Josh Moberg, Charlie Potts, and Rita Rosbach. And now we can proceed with opening statements. And the first person will be Mr. Dixon. Good evening. Um, thank you to the League of Women Voters. Um, I appreciate the work that you do uh, for organizing this, inviting us, hosting us. Uh, I appreciate that uh, you give people an opportunity because, be, to be uh, educated uh, voters. And I think that's an important thing to do. Uh, my name is Drew Dixon. Um, my family and I live here in St. Peter. We have students in the district. Um, I'm on the school board currently, acting as the board clerk. Um, entering or 
finishing my second term, so I've been eight years on the board and looking for um, the next term. A lot of stuff going on right now, um, here and in the country, um, public education is caught up in it, uh, just like everything else. So incredible times to be on a local governing body. Um, local control is a big issue. We're seeing that we have to make decisions that we probably haven't had to make before. Um, so <laughs> it has taken some guts and um, uh, it's just largely unprecedented. So we'll get into it, but thank you for having us tonight. Appreciate it. So Lola. Hello everyone, my name is Crystal Lola and I'm excited to be here tonight. I would like to thank the League of Women Voters, the St. Peter Herald, and the St. Peter Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event. I have lived and worked on our family farm just outside of St. Peter for 16 years along with my husband. I have three daughters who are in eighth, fifth, and second grade, and I've been actively involved in my children's education and schooling by participating and volunteering my time with South Elementary Parent Council, the North Elementary Parent Teacher Organization, and a variety of school fundraisers. I have enjoyed volunteering in the classroom and I've also chaperoned, chaperoned numerous class trips. I have gotten to know many of the teachers and staff over the last several years also. I am running for school board because I am passionate about the children of our community and their future at the St. Peter's School. If elected, I promise to listen to the parents and members of the community and ensure that their voices are heard and represented. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kate Martins. Thanks to the League of Women Voters, the St. Peter Herald and the St. Peter Chamber of Commerce for giving us this opportunity. Um, I've lived in St. Peter for, since 1980 and I have three sons who went through the school system here. I'm running for school board as a continuation of my lifelong commitment to public education. I see education as the foundation of everything society requires. Education has always been valued by the people who lived in this place. The Dakota from before, before the arrival of the Europeans and all of the immigrants who've come here since. To get today, the value of education is being challenged and the respect and compassion that was afforded to teachers and school staff at the beginning of the pandemic has been eroded. Everyone who lives in our community wants the best for their children, though there are differences as to how that looks. I believe that through respectful dialogue, the school board can provide a strong foundation for progress. It is the responsibility of the school board to support sta staff and students in implementing the district mission of creating critical thinkers and lifelong learners. This is why I'm a candidate. Thank you. And I just realized that I lied. We are not in alphabetical order. <laughs> not their fault. Um, Rita Rosbach, go ahead. Hi, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters, uh, the St. Peter Chamber of Commerce, and the St. Peter Herald. I moved into the St. Peter District with my husband and my two daughters just before my older daughter started kindergarten. Our daughters are now in 11th grade and 8th grade. I have a master's in occupational therapy with specialties in mental health and rehabilitation. I worked in direct client care and community outreach. And later, I worked as an advocate for people with developmental disabilities and their families. I served on the board of St. Peter's Creative Play Place, Mankato Ballet Company, Merely Players, and I currently serve on the Prairie Lakes Regional Arts Council Board. I'm also a Promoting Respect Facilitator for the Greater Mankato Diversity Council. I volunteered in our school district for seven years, helping with math and reading several days a week during the entire school year, and I loved every minute of it. I am now serving on the Advisory Council for our district's Office of Education Equity. I'm passionate about the education of all children, and I will bring a unique perspective to our school board. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie Potts. Hi, my name is Charlie Potts. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight at this forum, and thank you to, the, to having 10 candidates run for school board positions is fantastic, um, and I'm honored to be on the stage with all of you tonight. Um, I served on the St. Peter School Board from 2014 to 2017 and found it to be a rewarding and challenging experience. Uh, and in reflection, thinking that a, a $58 million referendum, hiring a new superintendent, building a new high school uh, seemed really challenging at the time, <laughs> but the world has changed since then. Um, I am also currently on the St. Peter Education Foundation and on the Hall of Fame Committee. 
my wife Angie taught in the, in the St. Peter School District for 10 years and is now the Director of Technology for Mankato Area Public Schools. I have two boys in the middle school, seventh grade twins. Um, I am a product of the St. Peter Schools and the child and grandchild of educators. Um, I am excited to potentially re-engage with this challenging work, doing the most important thing possible, caring for and educating our children in a community that I love. Thank you. <clears throat> our forum policies allow candidates who are unable to attend to present written statements, um, which I will now read um, for Mr. Carlson, excuse me, John Carlson and Marty Duncan, who are both candidates who fall within the category of, of candidates who, who have requested to have their statements read. Um, I will first share John Carlson's statement. Dear fellow candidates and League of Women voters, I am disappointed that I am unable to be here tonight as I am traveling with my tennis team to a tournament in Wisconsin this weekend. I'm excited that we have so many candidates running for the school board. I think that shows a passion and caring for our school district in our community. I am running for the board again because of that same passion. I want to do what I can to help teachers, administration, and staff provide the absolute best education possible for every student. I think education is of vital importance and can literally change the path of someone's life. I would love to have the opportunity to do what I can to help St. Peter's schools in offering a superior learning opportunity at every level, pre-K to grade 12, and even our adult programming. I want to do my part to offer an enriching and rewarding experience for everyone. Again, I apologize for being unable to attend. I have always looked forward to this candidate forum in the past. Thank you again to the League of Women Voters for putting on this forum. Have a great night. Um, next, I will read Martin Duncan's opening statement. Our role in this life is to cherish our children and help them to succeed in the adult world. Simple statement. That summarizes my role as teacher and board member. My name is Marty Duncan. I hold the doctor's degree in educational administration, although I rarely use the title. After 32 years as teacher and school superintendent, I served 10 years on the St. Peter board. In 2017, Governor Dayton appointed me to the board of directors at Minnesota State Academies, where I am in my fourth year. My career has been devoted to helping children to learn. There is one issue about which I am adamant. 10 years ago, a coalition of all the Minnesota agencies connected to education created Minnesota's Promise, in which our educators urged the legislature to lengthen the school year. Instead of lengthening the year to 180 days, the school year minimum was reduced to 165 days. I am vocally urging Governor Tim and our legislature to consider this issue. Our, our leaders berate and diminish the achievements of our students when evidence of a learning gap surfaces. We talk about disadvantages st students who exhibit poor skills on MCA and NWEA exams. And I'm sorry, my time is up. Um, I should note that the rules for providing a written statement require that the statement can be read within the allocated time period. <clears throat> okay, so now we will proceed with our questions. Um, the first question will be asked uh, first of Charlie Potts, then Kate Martins, then Drew Dixon, then Crystal Lola and Rita Rosbach. The first question is up here somewhere. There it is. This year's ballot contains the following operating referendum question. Proposal. The school district question on the November 2nd ballot indicates the board is proposing to increase its general education revenue by $410 per pupil. Further information from the district indicates that the current referendum set at $182.10 per pupil will expire on December 31st, 2021, leaving the rate at $0. Are you in support of the referendum, yes or no, and why? Again, Charlie Potts would be first. Thank you. Yes, I am in support of the referendum. Um, this is an operating levy um, that is vital to continuing the, the, the baseline basic, uh, a baseline basic continuity of programs and services in the district. 
Um, we have established over the last several years um, uh, outstanding programs that have, that have moved into this brand new fantastic, or a couple year old fantastic building. Um, and we need to make sure that we continue to provide innovative opportunities for students of all ages. Um, and, and sort of, to me, the, the issues with the operating levy are at the bookends right now, continuing to offer innovative options to prepare students for college and for the workforce, but also continuing to improve the menu of support services that our highest need students require. And I believe that the operating levy would uh, allow us to continue to provide the excellent services we do now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next will be Kate Martins. Yes, I am in support of the operating re referendum. Um, I am a retired teacher, so I've been on the other side of the, the decision-making process for school operating le levies and so on. Uh, if this re referendum goes through, we become a little bit closer to the to parity with the other school districts in the area. We currently are, are per, per, per pupil unit is about $182 per student. This would raise us to $410 per student, which gives us a real advantage in creating, as Charlie said, lots of good resources and so on. If the referendum pat fails, it will probably come back again. But in the meantime, there will be cuts that will have to be made, and some of it would be staff. And if it's staff, that could amount to about 10 teachers, and that means class sizes are going to increase, and the quality of education is definitely impacted. So I am in support of the referendum. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, person to respond is Drew Dixon. Uh, yes, I do uh, support the operating levy. Um, it's true that we have uh, levy dollars falling off. Um, so this is a way to equalize that, also um, ensure that we have funds for programming that we're committed to and that have already been established. We've got. We have some amazing program here, well, at all school levels, but, it's, but at the high school, because of the new facility, we've been able to do a lot of great things. We're really using the space. Um, we're, the, the growth in our uh, like technical um, programming has been um, impressive. We have the science wings. Um, we've, uh, it's just been so many programs that um, we've been impressed with. Anyway, if we lose the money, we're going to, we really put risk, um, put ourselves in risk and having to cut some of those programs. Um, staffing can become an issue. They can be done. It's done in other districts. Um, it would not be in our best interest to do so. Um, there are some other problems facing the district that we'll get into. Um, with uh, uh, the number of people in, in, in the district and in the students coming to the district, but we'll get into that at a later time. But yes, I fully support the uh, referendum. Um, at this point, I do support the, the operating levy. Um, I would like to learn more about it. Um, I think it's important that we do um, continue providing the superior services to our students. Um, and help them prepare for whatever path they choose after graduation, whether it be the trades or a four-year degree or even just going right into the workforce. Um, I think we need to look at what it, you know, right now, like what it's, what's all included and just decide if, you know, if everything can be passed or if there are things that we can cut back on. And I guess we'll have to go from there. Okay, and Rita Rosbach. I definitely support this levy. It replaces a levy that will expire this December. If we do not pass it, our school district will lose $450,000 a year. Um, and if we do pass it, we will have $550,000 a year for our students, our staff, our schools. Um, as Kate said, if this doesn't pass, we could lose teaching positions. It could also, as Drew said, um, We've, we have great programs, and they could be cut. We have wonderful ag programs. We have welding programs. We have a culinary program. Not a lot of schools have this, and I would love to see that our district and our schools still provide this for students who do not follow their traditional path of going to colleges. 
Um, this levy is a tax on a home property value as well as one acre of land. And it will cost, cost a homeowner of um, $150,000 home value $5 a month. Our students are definitely worth this, our teachers, our school district, definitely. Okay, thank you, candidates. Uh, the next question will first be addressed to Rita Rosbach, followed by Charlie Potts. Um, and I should note, this, uh, uh, that last question was a little long. If you need me to, re I can repeat any questions as, if necessary. Um, the second question is, multiple disciplines have stated that the pandemic has adversely affected the mental health of our students. Would you support increasing staffing for student mental health and counseling support services? Please explain your answer. And again, that'd be Rita Rosbach first, followed by Charlie Potts. I would definitely support that. I think in order for our students to get a really, to, to get a quality education, we need to support them not just in the academics, but we need to support their basic needs, and that includes mental health. This pandemic is something that we've never experienced before. We don't know how to get through this, and we have to get through this together. And we have to support our families, our students. Their mental health is definitely important, and we have to meet the children where their needs are as we go through this together. So yes. Okay. Um, after Charlie Potts, uh, we'll turn to Crystal Lola, then Drew Dixon, and finally Kate Martins for this question. Uh, Charlie Potts. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I have strong feelings about the uh, the increase in support to uh, or the increase in, in in staffing or assistance and resources to um, assist with mental health, the mental health impacts of the pandemic. I think that there are lingering effects of the pandemic that will that will go on for quite a while, that will be studied and researched. And um, I would love to have St. Peter be a case study in providing opportunities and resources for students um, to understand how to deal with the trauma of, of living through the pandemic. Um, and I think that the opportunity, not only for mental health counseling, but the increased need for paraprofessionals in the classroom to help with behavioral issues that will stem from um, adjustments made during the pandemic. Um, the idea of re-socialization, and particularly for the littles, for the little kids in our district, um, learning how to even be in school will be a, a tremendous thing um, to be focused on in the coming years. And so, yes, strong advocate for increased um, access and support for mental health for our students. Okay, uh, Crystal Lola. Uh, yes, I support uh, the increase in staff to help with the children's mental health. Um, my heart goes out to those students who are struggling with their mental health during this pandemic. It's been a challenge, I think, for students, staff, and children. Um, I think every family has dealt with it in different ways, and I guess we don't know exact, you know, I don't know exactly how other families have dealt with it, but it's been a, it's been a struggle in our house. And I think that we should provide resources for students, staff, um, students and staff to help them uh, with whatever mental health needs they have and should encourage everyone to seek uh, help if they need it. Um, and yeah, we just need to meet them where they're at and hopefully help them succeed. Okay. Drew Dixon. Uh, I do support. Um, your question was specifically the increasing of mental health? Uh, why don't I just reread it? Okay, um, sure. That I'll might be helpful even to the audience. Multiple disciplines have stated that the pandemic has adversely affected the mental health of our students. Would you support increasing staffing for student mental health and counseling support services? Please explain your answer. Yes, definitely. Um, so one of the conversations that came up when we were uh, debating the role of SROs in the, uh, in the schools, um, largely central to that debate was we need additional um, social work um, supports within our schools. And can we do this differently? Can we shift roles and responsibilities? Um, at, at this point, we've just added. Um, we have several buildings in the district, each of which have um, mental health concerns or needs, I should say. I mean, I think we've seen mental health issues within our students, our youth, um, creeping up over the last decade. Um, 
certainly exacerbated by the uh, pandemic recently. I don't know if we fully appreciate the needs that we truly have in all of our buildings. Um, and I don't think that's wrong. I think we're kind of going through this together as a nation. Um, but as to the question, do I support uh, additional supports and resources? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, without a doubt. We, before the pandemic, we had one of the lowest student to social worker counselor ratios in the country something like two or 300 students per counselor. That's unacceptable and it's even become worse since the pandemic. The kids last year had issues to deal with. They are now back in school and there are all kinds of things that are having to be done to help them. My master's is in gifted and talented education where there is a huge focus on social and emotional um, welfare of, of students, not just uh, students who've been identified as gifted. Um, mental health, is, in, is absolutely in connected to productive learning. A student can't learn if they are concerned about their family or about the world, any of those kinds of things. Um, more counselors, we need more social workers, we need more paras. The SRO is not a, a substitute for that, for that role in the school district. The students can maybe maybe form a relationship, but they need someone who's trained to deal with specific issues. I've been in schools where kids lost a teacher or, a, or a call, a, a, another student, and there aren't enough counselors in the world to deal with that situation when it happens. Yes, we need more. Okay, uh, Kate Martins will be first to respond to the next question, followed by Drew Dixon, then Rita Rosbach, Charlie Potts, and finally, Crystal Lola for the third question. In the coming year, you will make decisions concerning the physical health of our students. What factors will you keep in mind as you make those decisions? Excuse me, did you say physical health? Physical health, yes. Okay. Uh, schools have to be safe places. Students have to be respected and respectful. They have to be able to um, have relationships that are healthy. The teachers are trained to help work with those. This is a very difficult time. As I understand it, many of the students in the district are wearing masks, whether they're mandated or not. That's a health issue. It's a respect issue. It's a social um, commitment. It's a community commitment. Um, if these students, get these masks as a bullying topic, we need to be able to deal with that. The physical health of a student d determines how well they will be able to um, participate in education. Uh, we do a lot in terms of, and we d have done a lot over the course of the pandemic in terms of making food, that, making sure that they had nutrition appropriately. Um, we need to continue that connection and support all of the staff that will um, that to give students as much safety as they possibly can, we need safe spaces in which to work. Thank you. Uh, Drew Dixon. We, uh, we read the questions sure. once again. Yep. In the coming year, you will make decisions concerning the physical health of our students. What factors will you keep in mind as you make those decisions? What factors? Um, so yeah, elephant in the room, right now we're talking about masking in districts and it's been a contentious issue. That is not the only issue that goes on in a district. Um, things are warped right now, so that is a, uh, it's a high visibility topic and people are talking about it, but that's not all that we do. We also need to be concerned with um, nutrition in our schools. Um, we recently, well, for the last couple of years, we've had um, an outside vendor helping us with uh, meal prep and providing meals. Um, during the last year or so, that kind of went on autopilot. They've been a great partner with us getting nutrition out to the, um, it, into the community throughout the year, so we have that covered. But now that we're all back in school, hey, let's take a look, make sure that um, the right nutrition is getting to the right kids at the right time. Um, we're back in school, now Phi Ed's back on, which I think is a great thing, was lost largely last year. Um, 
I love seeing the kids back in school doing that. Um, I think it's important for us to continue to rely on expert guidance when it comes to pandemic protocols, um, viral transmissions. Those are uh, important for us for the success of the district. Um, and we've been promoting vaccines within the schools. Um, as part of that, I think we should continue to do so and uh, get our little guys vaccinated as soon as we can. Uh, let's see, Rita Rosbach is next. Um, this pandemic really has thrown us for a loop. And um, as Drew is talking about, it's, it's not just all about masking, it's taking care of kids in every way that we can regarding physical health. I know pandemic wise and being at home, um, definitely easy for me to put on those extra pounds. Um, and we need to, as the kids are back here, encourage the physical activity, which I think our PE teachers are doing a great job of. Um, also teaching the kids on how we need to look at staying healthy. And I really appreciate that our meals are free right now for our students, that we are making sure that they're having nutrition, um, breakfast in the mornings, lunch um, provided here. As Drew said, I also think that we need to follow expert guidance regarding the pandemic, um, that we need to listen to the physicians and make sure that our children are safe. Um, I think I read with um, Minnesota Education that they had their first, um, unfortunately, school staff death today since the school year started. And I would really like to keep our children safe from that. I don't like going by numbers. Our children are, need to be safe as well as their families. Thank you. Charlie Potts. Thank you. Uh, safety and physical safety is and ho always has been a top priority for the district. Um, when I served on the board four years ago, conversations were around uh, safety at entrances to buildings and reconfiguring entrances to make sure that uh, and, and make sure that entrances were secure um, in, in ramping up Alice trainings and, and various scenarios so that teachers and students were prepared for potential physical harm. So I think it's always been a priority. I think obviously now some of the physical safety has shifted to uh, discussions around COVID. Um, I am a firm believer that mitigation strategies are needed. Um, we know that vaccines can work and can be helpful in, in minimizing the impacts, but we also know that a large percentage of our children can't be vaccinated. Um, so strong believer in mitigation strategies for COVID. Um, I also think that an important thing that we need to continue to think about is physical safety as it's related to inclusion and specifically bias. Um, and so providing continued education and support of staff who are helping to address that. You know, I think one of the factors for that is, is continued uh, diving into understanding our climate and culture of inclusion and promoting inclusion. Thanks. And Crystal Lola. Uh, yes, um, I believe that we absolutely need to provide our students and staff with um, a safe and inclusive environment for everyone. Um, I also agree with Rita that the free lunches have been great for a lot of the students in our district. Um, I know that a lot of the kids take advantage of the brec free breakfast also. Um, I also am glad that the students have gotten back into sports. They're, um, I know my daughter has been really enjoying being back in sports and competing and having FIAD in school. Um, I think it's important to have a really good physical health, which makes your mental health better also. Um, as far as the masking, um, I, I support parent choice. I guess I do not support mandating masks for students and staff. Um, I do support a policy that allows for the freedom of choice and a zero tolerance policy for harassment against students and staff for their individual choice that they make. Um, if someone feels the need to wear a mask or socially distance at, for their safety, I support their right to do that. And I also expect um, those same people to respect the rights of others that choose differently. Um, ultimately, I think parents should have the choice to decide what is best for their child. Um, as far as the vaccine, I guess I'm also a, I I. I, do, I support vaccines, but I also do not support a vaccine mandate. Parents should have the last choice. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, Crystal Lola will answer this next question first, followed by Rita Rosbach, then Charlie Potts, then Kate Martins, and uh, Drew Dixon will be last. Question, uh, the fourth question is, given the evolving demographics of our city, which are reflected in our student population, what role, if any, does the board have in assuring diversity, equity, and inclusion in our schools? Uh, whenever you're ready, Crystal Lola. All right. Um, yes, we are. We do have a, an evolving demographic, demographic um, in, our, in our school district. Um, I think it's important that we get to know um, the needs of all of our community members and how we can best serve them and help them um, achieve success in school. We should get to know um, what the different cultures, what their needs are, um, and have training for our teachers on how to promote their cultural differences within the classroom. I think we should encourage family involvement in our schools and in our community. Uh, we should provide curriculum that is inclusive and um, helps make sure that all students are included and acknowledge the unique differences that each student may possess. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me see here. Next is Rita Rosbach. I think equity has been quite an interesting topic lately, and I think we need to remember that equity means that no matter what a student's background is, language, race, socioeconomic status, gender, learning capability, disability, or family history, that each of our students needs to have the opportunity to get to the support and resources they need to be successful in their educational journey. I think that our students need to feel a true sense of belonging in the school district. and. That is part of the reason that our school district, and I'm, part of the reason why I'm running for school board is because we, I strongly believe in our Office of Education Equity, um, and I'm so thankful to be able to be on the advisory council to look at what possible changes our students are facing here with our changing demographics. Um, if I look at the history of our school board itself, in 150 years, I don't think that we have had a person of color on our school board. And our students see this, and they see that the school board doesn't reflect our school population, which is over 30% students of a different color. We need to show and represent our students in a way that they understand that we truly support them, that we do reflect our community, so that we can form a community that supports everybody. Thank you. Charlie Potts. Thank you. Uh, I grew up in St. Peter and spent my childhood and went to college in St. Peter and left for a while, came back about 10 years ago, and it is amazing to see what our city looks like now compared to when I grew up here. Um, I, you know, when I think about equity, I think it's about providing opportunity to all students, meeting them where, meeting them where they are in their development and their family's ability to access resources. Um, I think we need to continue to strive to close the achievement gap we have really good pockets of success in this. Certain people and certain programs within the district are doing fantastic work. Uh, but systemically and in terms of policy and process, we have work to do. I was the chair of the policy committee last time I was on the board. Um, we started looking at this four years ago, and it's one of the areas that needs constant attention. Do our policies serve all families? Do our policies inhibit access to resources or make it more challenging for some families to succeed? Um, and I think about this a lot in, in equity in terms of say, do, and be. I think that districts often get stuck at doing. We say that equity is important. Um, we start doing some things to support equity and, and, meet, and serving all families. Um, but the being, being, it's, it's who we are and it's wrapped into everything that we do. And I think a lot of districts get stuck right before that. Um, and I think that that is where all of the heavy lifting comes in and the board can support the great work that is happening in our buildings um, to try to help us be better. Thanks. Thank you. Kate Martins. The role of the school board in supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion is huge. The school board has a, a big hand in things like uh, hiring, finding, hiring, and maintaining the educators who look like students in the classroom. 
it is true that we have this wonderful new um, equity and inclusion office and we have great potential. Our, our teachers, our staff, and our students have been working with curriculum from um, Bukata Hayes and the Mankato Area Diversity Council. That is great work. The board will support this um, by making sure that language is there for rep, uh, respecting students' distinct cultures, their learning styles, their um, looking at testing to, to make sure that it's inclusive and, and not exclusive. Equity is not equality. Equity says, like Charlie said, meeting you where you are and giving you the access to the resources to take you where you can go. Um, one of the concerns that I have as a French and German teacher is that we just took French off the curriculum. I don't expect that we put French or German back, but we do have other languages that should be taught in this, in this school district. Spanish, I've always said, should start in pre-K, and every kid should have access to a Spanish learning language and then learn another language. That's in, intensely important. Thank you. Um, just because it's been a while, I think I'm going to repeat. The question is regarding evolving demographics of the city that are reflected in our student population. What role, if any, does the board have in assuring diversity, equity, and inclusion in our schools? And Drew Dixon. Yeah, the board has a distinct role. Um, so when we look at uh, drivers of diversity, equality, inclusion, um, it seems like uh, the culture of the body of students of the district is at the, the core, core tenement of that. Is everyone, is everyone included? Does everyone feel that they are on the same playing field as everyone else? No one's left out. Everyone has the same opportunities and same options as everyone else. So how do we get there? How do you create a culture like that at a district? The board can make some um, specific moves and typically it's done through hiring. Um, the most important and it's not always available to every board, but if you have an opportunity to hire a superintendent or bring a new superintendent on, that person will probably do the most for a district to set the tone of the culture of the district. Um, and I think that we've done that uh, this year. It's been a trying year, but it has been, business has been moving forward. Um, another thing that the board can do, as we did do, was uh, set directives for that superintendent to say, okay, Equity work in the district is of a priority for you, and those are the things that we're going to, one of the things you'll be judged on at the end of your um, year for review. Um, we have two uh, new community li liaisons uh, that have been with us for maybe a little over a year. Um, a, a good first step. The next question, we'll, we will start with Drew Dixon. I don't know if any of you are noticing a pattern here. <laughs> Number five seems to be number one in the next round. So Drew Dixon is number one, Charlie Potts number two, uh, then Rita Rosbach, Kate Martins, and Crystal Lola for the fifth question. Um, many of these questions have come from the community and this, this is one of them. How might the candidates feel about year round school to utilize the many very costly buildings we have? You know, I honestly uh, can't say I've land on one side or the other firmly on this issue. I know that in other states or areas of the country, this is a reality. I have a brother who lives in Raleigh, Carolina, or North Carolina, and his um, kids are going to school full time. They take maybe several breaks throughout the, the year. Uh, we can recognize that our seasonal schooling is a byproduct of our lar large agriculture background, um, much of which it's still here, that's still us, but it doesn't necessarily affect as many of us as it did at one time. The small farms are not uh, as prevalent. Um, so the answer is I would be open to continue looking at this because it is an active topic that is discussed, I would say, every year, especially at the MSBA conference. Um, it certainly comes up. There are, <laughs> there are pluses and minuses on both sides. For a change of that, that level, it would really take community buy-in, and I know that people really protect their summers. It's a very Minnesotan thing to do. That would be a high, 
um, a high hurdle to get over, but I'd be open to it. Okay. Charlie Potts. Thank you. Um, I must admit that I have not read much about, <laughs> you know, the, the effects of year-round school. I, the, what little I know um, is that I understand that it does uh, help in narrowing uh, achievement gaps. I think it does assist, you know, the, the brain drain or the loss of learning that happens for kids when they um, have a summer break uh, is real. I think there is also, uh, for many children, not true across the board, but for many children, there is a significant mental health uh, boost from having an opportunity to have a break from school. And that, of course, is not true for all families and all situations, but um, I think that I think that the idea of lessening learning loss would be important, and I think that lessening the idea of the socialization that's lost is important. However, I think as, as Drew noted, the you know, tremendous community buy-in would have to happen, and um, really a tremendous philosophical shift in how our curriculum is structured, how it would look, and how um, delivery methods would need to look. So. Um, I would definitely need to do more research, though um, I don't know that it is something I would support right now in the immediate. Okay, Rita Rosbach. I agree with Charlie. I'd have a lot more learning that I would have to do um, in regards to year-round school. I do also agree with Charlie that there is some brain drain during the summer, that there is a loss of learning, and um, that's where you actually see some disparities with um, privilege, actually. You'll have st some students whose parents still send them to programs where they continue learning, and some parents who can't afford it, can't access it, and that increases that gap for students, which I think we'd have to really look at. Um, is this something that would help? But also, you have your families who are still farming, and it possibly would affect them, and I would love to speak with farming families to see how that would affect them. Um, families are protective of their time. Family time is very important, and could we factor that in? There are vacations, there's family time where parents you know, can take that break with their children and not have to worry about missing school. Um, there are other programs during the summer that I'm sure families would like to access. I, will admit that my family is one of them. My daughters go away for five weeks for, profession, or for um, ballet, and we'd still like to be able to do that if we could. But it, it's going to take some more exploration before I could make a decision. Thanks. Uh, Kate Martins. I can honestly say I have a little bit of knowledge about some of this as a French and German teacher because that's the kind of situation that happens in Europe. We're not talking about 365 days a year. We're talking about large blocks of instruction and smaller times of not being in school, three to five weeks, that kind of thing. Uh, that is, a, is something that would really be a perfect way for the district to engage with the community because it will require a lot of planning, a lot of input. All of the stakeholders in our school of edu in our education system could, re could be brought into this whole discussion. Um, the summer as an educator, as a classroom teacher, we all know that the first several weeks of school is just kind of catching up with what they forgot over the course of the summer. That's not the student's fault. Um, as Rita said, this could be a really good way to provide some equity for students to have access to quality programs that might not be able to do that um, as, as at such a great rate as some parents can afford to do. Um, retail businesses would have to be part of this discussion as well. Um, longer breaks help. Parents can learn to adjust that, and nobody takes, most people don't take a four week break a vacation anyway. So it would change, the, it's a paradigm shift. We could do it. I think we need to talk about it. Okay, and again, we're talking about the potential for year-round school in Crystal Lola. I also do not know uh, very much about year-round school. Um, I guess I would, I'd like to know more about um, 
like you spoke about the blocks of time, like how much, you know, how much vacation time would the kids get? Would they get, you know, a bigger holiday break for, you know, so families could do family trips? What, what does the summer look like? Um, I know my kids always look forward to spending time at the lake. Um, they also look forward to doing camps in the summer and other activities, just kind of having some downtime. And I know that, you know, the, the loss of learning obviously is affected by summer vacation. Um, so I, I am interested to see how that could be improved. Um, I know for farm families, farm families, I, my husband and I farm, and our really busy time is spring and fall. So the summertime, there is some busyness, but for us, I guess, the summer vacation, we try to maximize with, you know, spending time as a family. Um, so I guess it, I would just say that I, I don't know enough to say I would support it or not support it. Okay. And Crystal, you'll be asked to respond to the next question first, followed by Kate Martins. Um, how does the school board balance the educational needs for all students whose post-graduation plans may include college, vocational training, immediate entry into the workforce, or military service? Well, I think St. Peter does a pretty good job of balancing that. I know we have um, excellent uh, course offerings for for kids who are interested in a four-year degree, and also we have a lot of uh, the tech classes for students looking to go into more of the um, the trades programs and also I think they do a good job of getting the students ready for um, life after school to you know be able to thrive in the community I think that's that's the biggest goal is to to thrive in whatever direction you choose after um, you complete high school so I think we just need to to find the balance of you know, having a wide variety of classes that the students can um, choose their path basically to, to help set them up for success. Okay, Kate Martins. Uh, the school board is, is critical in being able to allow students to follow the paths that they choose. Tr uh, the traditional path for so many years has been going from high school to college. That is no longer the case. We don't necessarily have jobs for everyone who goes to college. Kids are going into, communi into community colleges, junior colleges, and just trade, um, trade training as well as the military. Um, for years, we've said that we're teaching kids for jobs that we don't even know, ex they don't even exist right now, and that kids will change professions seven times during their, their lives and all of those kinds of things. So this has been an ongoing process, which is becoming more marked as we emerge, hopefully, from this pandemic. The way the school, can, the school board can do this is to support the mission statement, teaching kids, allowing kids to develop critical thinking skills, uh, in, um, investigative techniques, creative problem solving, and a, and a, and a joy in learning, a, th a thirst for learning so that they will be lifelong learners. And the school board will support that in developing curriculum and adding programs like STEM and STEAM that were, are relatively new things. That's a school board job. Thank you. Okay, I'll repeat the question and then it will be Drew Dixon, Rita Rosbach, and Charlie Potts. Uh, the, how does the school board balance educational needs for all students whose post-graduation plans may include college, vocational training, immediate entry into the workforce, or military service? Drew Dixon. Yeah, um, the school board does that by uh, ensuring that we have resources to provide opportunities. Um, and to go back to initially, that's, that's what that operating level is about. So we can keep programs um, open and available for our students. We've got great academies here, impressive levels of academies at, 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 on this campus. Ag academies, we're doing tech, we're doing food science on and on. Um, the students that are involved in those academies are being trained up and moving up and out the doors of St. Peter High School. Most certainly will need additional training afterwards to, to, as they seek, seek their careers, but that's not necessarily a four-year degree. Um, that landscape has shifted quite a bit, and we don't 
Uh, gone are the days that we're trying to uh, encourage everyone to go to a four-year degree or go to the military, and that's it. Those days are, are over, and we recognize that. So the best thing that we can do is provide opportunities for our students um, and give, give options, give choices. Okay. No Rossbach. As Drew said, I think the school board is key in um, making sure that we do have those resources so that our students can follow the path that best fits them as individuals. Um, <laughs> we need to pass this referendum so that we can do this, um, so that we have the, the classes, the ag classes, the welding classes, the culinary arts classes to enhance the other classes that we have to seek traditional college courses as well. I think another thing that our um, board can also do is make sure that we have partnerships in our community. We have potential, I, I think, um, programs where we could serve with apprenticeships, where we can connect with, maybe do some more connection with um, Gustavus. I appreciate the fact that we have PSEO classes um, and college level courses that my daughter is taking right now and taking advantage of that. And I think the board making sure that we have school counselors who can help guide our children, who can speak to them and let them know what is in the world. Um, making sure that we have teachers who are familiar with the possible fields that our kids can go into. Um, also making sure that we look at equity and making sure that our, all of our children get that service. Thank you. Okay, Charlie Potts. It's hard to answer fifth, great answers. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, <laughs> right? I think that the, the board needs to provide resources um, and support the vision of the great programs that already exist, the college in the classroom, the culinary trades, the Ag Academy, all those things. Um, also agree that, that resources in terms of staffing, uh, counseling centers, support that they can support students for career readiness, support students for college preparation. You know, I think that the, the board can also um, assist in advocating and pushing for, you know, leveraging relationships in the community for internships, job opportunities for training. Um, and so, um, yeah, and, and, and assist in um, administrative leadership, being able to continue to hire and ret retain talented teachers who can help students through um, all of the important curricular experiences and then supplement with co-curricular and, uh, uh, and other opportunities um, to be ready for college or the workforce or the military or whatever they choose to do when they walk out the doors. So, thanks. Okay. Uh, we have two more questions, and I think we're going to have time to get them both in before closing, closing remarks. Um, Charlie Potts will be first, then Kate Martins, then Crystal Lola, then Drew Dixon, and uh, last will be Rita Rosbach for this question. Given a limited budget and growing demands of gifted and talented English language learners, what is your strategy for managing these demands from parents and families? And how do you go about distributing resources so all students have opportunities? I'm sorry, could you repeat? Um, so let me rephrase it just a little bit. So the, the inquiry is, what is your strategy for managing these demands from parents and families? And how do you go about distributing resources so all students have opportunities? And the question is in regard to growing demands of gifted and talented and English language learners. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I go back to, I think, one of, the, one of the answers I gave about the operating levy and the need to um, advocate for the passing of the levy it, um, or to vote for the, for the levy to pass is that, um, that some of the issues that arise are kind of both ends of the spectrum in terms of opportunities for students, right? The continued growth of innovative programs and innovative opportunities um, to get students ready for college or career. Um, gifted and talented, probably falling into that mix as well, right? Is, is some of the innovative programs that St. Peter has been able to establish and how do we continue those? And on the other end of the spectrum um, is the student support services, um, the programs that are needed for our students who uh, fall into categories like English language learners and, 
and how do we um, meet the need for all. Um, I think that those demands um, are tough with limited resources. Um, and so I think that that is where uh, community input, I think that is where input from administrative leadership, input from teachers, um, is incredibly valuable in understanding the current climate and the current needs um, of the students in the district, knowing that those evolve over time. And so what is one, a priority one year may change by the next. Um, but agree, very difficult decisions to make uh, with limited priorities, or excuse me, limited resources. Kate Martins. Well, the referendum is one good way to make sure that this is, this is addressed by making sure that our, our per pupil unit comes into some sort of alignment with other schools in the area. Um, gifted and talented is, is my wheelhouse. And ELL, as a language teacher, that's the thing. And oftentimes what we know is that gifted, talented kids come from ELL populations and the challenge of of, ad of addressing their abilities um, as they learn the language is, is always there. One of the things that I think that this, the school board can do is to enc encourage interdisciplinary work among the various content areas because that will help having pairs available who have, co have contact with the populations that are in, in need of a little bit of support. Co-curriculars are huge in, in helping the kids first, first of all form relationships, relationships with staff, um, and then get them, getting themselves validated. The Equity and Inclusion Office was a huge uh, resource for this. Um, they will serve as a sounding board for many ideas um, and incorporations for teachers. The, dis the board has a lot of resources available and with the referendum, they will be able to even do more. Thank you. Crystal Lola. Uh, yeah, I, I believe we need to encourage and support um, our gifted and talented students. Um, I think that's very important to help them reach their highest potential. Um, I think we also need to make sure that all students um, have the resources to succeed. I, I think I would look towards our educators to see what, um, what they think we need to do to help provide the programs that would um, the programs and additional learning and enrichment opportunities to the children. Um, I think it's important to expose them to a variety of uh, activities that allow them to experience um, some self-confidence along with small group tutoring that helps them uh, reach their academic needs. Uh, I think we also need to monitor their need for extra help and provide help to make sure that all students succeed. I think that the school board can help by giving our teachers the resources to provide extra help to the students who need it. Uh, next is Drew Dixon, and then Rita Rosbach would be last. Go ahead, Drew Dixon. If you'd be so kind. Something about this question is uh, <laughs> not getting through my brain. Okay, so uh, I'm saying that the question is being, that's, that's asked is, what is your strategy for managing the demands from parents and families for services, and how do you go about distributing resources so all students have opportunities and it started off with uh, giving, a, given a limited budget and growing, growing demands of gifted and talented and English language learners, what would be your strategy for managing the distribution of funds for those services? That is an interesting question. So in many ways, it's very tactical. Um, and honestly, a board would not be tackling an issue like that. Um, that would be something that a superintendent would, certainly. Um, board, or I'm sure I should say the principals, uh, building leadership definitely would. Um, we would have some oversight in something like that coming to us, but just because of the nature of it, it's so tactical, I don't think it would be something that the board would take on. Now, aside from that, um, I agree money for programming, opportunities, that is going to be our answer for um, gifted and talented, certainly. Um, also for uh, English language learners. Um, back to the equity supports that we already have been working on and that work continues uh, through uh, our liaison work with the, the communities. Um, at some point that will f 
flourish or, and play out, and uh, we will feel like, okay, we're more interconnected with um, more communities, <laughs> more people within our community, and the next step will be X. I don't think we totally know what the next step is going to be, because right now we're building culture and relationships and community. Uh, that day will come. Thanks. Rita Rosbach. Can I say what he said? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I do think that we need to listen um, and educate ourselves on what the needs are for our families, for the English language learners and what gifted and talented um, students have. I, I think things are probably different now than they were before. And if we don't, don't educate ourselves on what the current needs are um, and listen to the families that we have with our changing demographics, then we might put our resources towards an area where they aren't needed. And I think we need to be good stewards of um, meeting the actual needs, not what we may think they are. Um, the referendum is huge. We need those funds to be able to provide the staff to possibly you know, increase our teaching teachers and our the number of teachers we have, the number of paras we have, so that we can meet the needs of the students. Our, our teachers balance so much with our students. They are absolutely amazing. And when I think of how many children they take care of every day and the different levels of the different children with all the different backgrounds of these children, it's amazing. Um, and so I think we need to make sure that we meet the needs there as well. Thank you. Okay, um, the, the final question tonight. Climate change is a major concern for many citizens. What efforts should the school board take to decrease the district's carbon footprint? And Rita Rosbach is first, Crystal Lola second, Charlie Potts third, uh, Kate Martins fourth, and Drew Dixon fifth. Um, one of the things that I think we can do is continue the wonderful job of teaching our students how to be better stewards of our earth. Um, both of my uh, daughters have had projects of um, just how to, how to be a better steward, how to leave less of a carbon footprint. Um, some of the things that we can look at are pursuing sources for re renewable energy, replacing um, gas appliances, gas water heaters with electric, encouraging our children to even walk to school. We could use environmentally friendly cleaning fluids. Um, we could try to cut down on our use of plastics. Um, there's something called the Green Schools Initiative, which I don't know if our schools participate in, but that is something that we could look into. Um, there are partnerships with grants available for electric and battery powered tools to replace gas tools. I think that's something that we could look into and possibly look at electric charging stations for electric vehicles um, and maybe add electric vehicles to our school's fleet. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Crystal Lola. Yes, climate change, uh, it's a big topic. Um, personally, on our farm in 2015, we put up a solar array. We have some dual access trackers and they're kind of neat. They, they track the sun, you get the maximized uh, amount of uh, sun hitting your panel so you get the best um, pr production of electricity. So that's been great on our farm. It's, kind of, it's offset um, the electrical bill on our farm operation in our pig barn. Um, I think installing some solar panels, possibly on the school's roofs, um, would be a great way to help offset the school's electric consumption. Um, I also think, I've heard that, or I know that the school um, in the lunchroom, there's a lot of single-use items that they're using, and I talked to some of the staff in there, and they said that they're having some issues with students throwing the silverware away, and so it became more of a cost issue to replace the silverware than to just use the disposable, but I still feel like we should figure out a way to not have to use single-use items, especially in the lunchroom. Um, I think that, you know, turning off lights in rooms when they're not in use, maybe we could put in some and I don't know if they're currently in this building, but um, you know, like a, a sensor when there's nobody in the room. Also, I thought about a garden or utilizing the greenhouse um, that the kids could get in um, some experience 
growing food and understanding um, how food production impacts our environment and just getting some experience with that. Charlie Potts. Thanks. Um, yeah, to echo some other comments, I think educating students is the top priority um, about recycling, composting. I work with college students and uh, who are still learning to recycle. And I think we take for granted often that students, when we just say to do something, um, that they'll learn how to do it without extra pushes and understand it. Like if we don't tell them the why, then often that is not a lesson that will be learned. Um, I think that the district can be, you know, the board is probably um, most able to help with thinking about being mindful of contracts um, with vendors and with, you know, when possible, because of course following state law takes priority, but when I, th I think about construction, work, bus companies, et cetera, um, and, and using as many environmentally friendly vendors as possible. Um, when renovating buildings, do all we can to make sustainable and continue to seek grants and programs to support creative initiatives. Thanks. Okay. Um, let me see. One, two, three. Uh, Kate Martins is next. Well, climate change, the kids are all in on this. They, have, they get it, and we're trying to pick it up. Um, the phrase that, I, that comes to my head is think globally, act locally, and the school board can do that. This is a perfect place for connections between the community, the businesses, families, and the school. And the school board is that intersection to allow those kinds of connections to be made. Um, things like purchasing, like everybody said, purchasing electric vehicles and charging stations. Man, we're in a place for a wind power right here. Um, solar energy. Um, using renewables, uh, encouraging kids to come up with answers. Kids don't need to always be told what to do, ask them, because they have ideas. And the school board has input from students, and that can be increased, because they're going to have some really great ideas. And then there's always bikes. This is, a, this is an area that we could just expand bikes, give kids access to it, give them training, get them on bikes now, and they'll be doing it for the rest of their lives. So there are all kinds of things that the school board can do to facilitate the district coming out on top of the climate change issue. Okay, Drew Dixon. Uh, yeah, I agree with, with everything that's been said here. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> um, yes, there's things that we can do uh, in a more small level, like, hey, let's reduce consumables. Let's reduce the amount of water. There's ways that we can do that. We can um, reduce the amount of electricity, and that's already being done. Like when we go through and we're uh, redoing lighting for uh, Building A or Building B or North or South, we're moving to LEDs. Shocking how much uh, money that saves in electricity and consumption. Um, it's not about the money; it's about the consumption. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, they, those have big impacts immediately. But if we're looking at um, how can we make the largest impact? Um, to uh, the carbon footprint um, uh, of this planet and of our responsibility, it is absolutely through educating of our students. They are the ones who are going to take the lessons that we're teaching here far and wide. Um, if it's a priority, priority for us, um, if we are teaching stewardship, how things are interconnected, how my actions are going to affect you and vice versa, um, and they, you know, take those lessons and lay them out and look, okay, so how does that work for the environment? And th that is understood. Those lessons are taken into the world um, and will reap huge benefits for all of us. Okay. So as I um, already uh, noted, though, the, that concludes the list of questions that we have for this evening. So we will proceed with closing remarks. Um, let me see, I wrote down, we were going to how much time did we agree on for closing remarks? A minute and a half? A minute and 15? Okay, thank you. A minute and 15 seconds for each of you, and the order is Kate Martins, Drew Dixon, Charlie Potts, Crystal Lola, and then Rita Rosbach. So go ahead, Kate Martins. Well, I want to thank again the, the uh, League of Women Voters and um, the Chamber of Commerce and the St. Peter Herald for hosting this. 
I also want to say thank you to all of my fellow candidates who are here and took the time, and it's a job to do this. Um, the school board exists as a connection between the school, the community, students, and parents. It's a place for information to be shared safely and respectfully, and for decisions in the best interest of the student to be made. It should not be partisan or contentious, but cooperative, modeling inclusive problem solving for students. Over my time with students, I've had the pleasure of seeing so many aha moments as students make connections and find excitement in learning. Supporting a highly diver qualified, diverse staff, which facilitates this learning and uses resources wisely, those are the principal functions of the school board. I hope to be able to serve on this school board to participate in these outcomes. Thank you. Uh, Drew Dixon. Yes, thank you, League of Women Voters, for hosting us tonight. Um, thank you, candidates. Uh, I am pleased that we have uh, as many men and women running for these uh, three open slots that are coming up. Um, it's something that I think a number of us on the board have been advocating for um, for some time, and uh, I'm just pleased. Thank you. Um, so, uh, concluding my second term here, that's eight years on the board, that's a long time. Um, I'm looking for another, another term. Uh, I think it's important. We have some important issues before us. I, val I uh, value thoughtful deliberation, um, reliance on the uh, expert guidance around us for current issues and ongoing issues. That has never changed or, or wavered. Um, the issues have changed and um, come and gone, but um, that's where my head is at. Um, I'm here for the students for the benefit of the students. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie Potts. Thank you. Uh, yeah, also grateful for the opportunity to serve, uh, the opportunity to potentially serve on the school board. Uh, also very happy to see 10 candidates, that's fantastic. We need more people uh, to step up and take on leadership roles in our community. Um, well, there are some big things on the plate right now for the district and the school board. I encourage voters to also think beyond this being a one or two issue election. There are dozens and dozens of issues that a school board must think about and do to support our outstanding district staff um, to maintain the high level of education that we expect in St. Peter. Uh, and, all, and for all those things to continue to happen, we need a board who can think critically, appreciate all perspectives, and invest in collaborative efforts on all issues in order to make St. Peter schools an even better place to educate our children. Thank you. <clears throat> Crystal Lola. Again, uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters um, and also to the, my fellow candidates that are up here tonight. Um, it's all about the kids. Um, I'm running for school board, again, because I do have a passion for our children and their education. And um, I promise to listen to the parents and members of the community and ensure that their voices are heard and represented on the board. Um, I would appreciate your vote and thank you. And Rita Rosbach. Our common goal is to prepare our children for a successful future. They're better prepared for that world when they have exposure to a wide range of experiences and perspectives. It's important that we come together as a community to provide a safe environment in which our children can explore and discover their true selves in this complicated world. St. Peter has the teachers, staff, and administrators, and community members to be leaders in education in Minnesota. I believe that education is more than what we learn in the classroom. It's also shared experiences, social activities, and community interactions. I believe in approaching issues using critical thinking skills, the same skills we need to be teaching our children. I believe in the importance of becoming a lifelong student. I believe in a school board that better represents our students and community. I entered this campaign with humility, knowing that I can't know everything, and I promise to be open-minded and to continue to learn. I believe in respectful dialogue and would love to meet with anyone to just discuss what we need to be working on for our students. I believe in education always, and I thank you for inviting us to this forum and to my fellow candidates. I appreciate it. Thank you. I will now read the closing statement for, Ms. for Martin Duncan. Some parents will argue that the school board does not have the authority to mandate masks. 
that is the false question. When you enroll your children in a school, you are agreeing to follow and enforce the rules of that school. That is your choice to enroll. I spoke earlier about the learning gap. That gap suggests that pupils with low achievement must be brought up to those exhibiting higher achievement. In effect, use of this phrase teaches people a falsehood, namely that good achievement is a single point for every student at a grade level. The phrase suggests our job as educators is to train pupils, bring them all to one common point. My emphasis is this, education does the opposite of training. Instead of one common point, the objective of training, our schools provide education that promotes the development of gifts and talents of all students, which ultimately will yield greater differentiation, not less. We must challenge our teachers, challenge their students to achieve more than any of us thought possible. That is a purpose for a longer school year. Thank you for listening. My name is Martin Duncan. And now the remarks from, uh, closing remarks from John Carlson. I'm excited that we have so many candidates running for the school board. I think that shows a passion and caring for our school district in our community. I'm running for the board again because of that same passion. I want to do what I can to help teachers, administration, and staff provide the absolute best education possible for every student. I think education is of vital importance and can literally change the path of someone's life. I would love to have the opportunity to do what I can to help St. Peter's schools in offering a superior learning opportunity at every level, pre-K to grade 12, and even our adult programming. I want to do my part to offer an enriching and rewarding experience for everyone. Again, I apologize for being unable to attend. I have always looked forward to this candidate forum in the past. Thank you again to the League of Women Voters for putting on this forum. This concludes our forum. Thank you so much to all of the candidates for sharing your thoughts on the issues. Uh, to the audience, if we ran out of time uh, before uh, any of your questions were answered or if you would like more information from the candidates, please contact them directly. The school district office and website have uh, contact information for all of the can candidates available. The forum will be aired on St. Peter Public Access TV and on YouTube. You can check your schedule for times. We want to thank the partners to the St. Peter League of Women Voters. Again, that's the St. Peter Herald and the St. Peter Chamber of Commerce. In addition, I, we had the help tonight of my assistants um, uh, sitting to my right, timers in the audience with their, with their stop signs and yield signs, other volunteers, the filming crew, and of course our candidates and you, the public, who are uh, the purpose for this event. Finally, I want to encourage everyone to vote Voting is on November 2nd this year. Early voting has started. If you need information about voting, you can go to the website minvotes.org. That is M-N-V-O-T-E-S.org. Thank you and good night.